Welcome, everyone, to another episode of the Aristocrat Soccer Podcast. This week, we are joined by Louisville City head coach, John Hackworth. John, welcome to the show. Thanks, Jake. Happy to be here. How you doing, John? It's David. Uh, thank you so much for coming on. Really appreciate you taking the time. Sorry, Dave. I forgot to introduce you. That's my, that's my, that's my mistake there. No, um, no so, John, <laughs> so, John, um, obviously, the, the national team has finally gotten back into, into playing after all the COVID restrictions with travel and all that. And they had two very impressive uh, performances the last couple of days in the 6-2 win over Panama. As someone who's been so involved in the under-17 setup and the national team setup, throughout the years, what are your thoughts on, on kind of U.S. soccer right now? Oh, I think it's great. Um, you know, I've personally, uh, in these last two games, uh, had the opportunity to sit a lot of my former players on the field, uh, which is always nice. Uh, you know, there you have you know, Sebastian Sudo scores two goals there at the end of that game. Um, you know, so, but there's a lot of, you know, Geo starts with a, a goal on a free kick. There's a lot to be enthusiastic about as a U.S. men's national team fan right now. I, I know from my personal experience how deep the pipeline of young players coming through is right now. And you're just seeing a, a sample of that. Um, but then you got guys like Weston and, and Tyler who are, are clearly going to be mainstays in the midfield for a long time to come. And this team didn't even have some of its you know better players available I mean I heard talk all week about lack of a number nine and yet you have Josh Sargent out there and Io Akinola you know I mean uh, Daryl TK these guys in, there's a lot of good players in the U.S. right now and it's it's if you really know it then it's an exciting time to be a, a fan of the U.S. national team. Yeah, absolutely. I remember I, I well, actually was having that same conversation in my friend's group chat this week or after the first game against Wales. We were because Legette was playing up front and he's not necessarily a, a pure number nine. And we're, we were we were having the discussion. We were going to be like, is, is it just going to be Altator is the best option uh, for the 2022 kind of cycle in World Cup? And then you see two young guys come in, both score brace. And then you have, like you mentioned, Akinola is someone that we actually played against last year with TFC2. And he is just a beast. And then you, you see it, especially in the, um, the Disney or sorry, the, the MLS is back tournament where he did very well and, and DK. Uh, so it, it's a definitely an exciting time uh, for, for U.S. soccer. So many good young midfield players and players at big clubs. Yeah, I, I can't say enough about it. And, and, you know, having had the privilege to be around some of the guys, both with the full team uh, with the previous Olympic cycle and with the 17s, um, you know, it's fun to watch some of those guys come through and, and show really well. Well, John, I was, I was curious to uh, maybe jump in, in a little bit with Louisville City and um, just coming off the recent season, what your thoughts were. And as you're going into now, 20, getting ready for 2021, you know, what, what, uh, what plans are, are being executed, you know, what players you're looking at, that type of thing. I mean, not specific, obviously, but just, you know, what are you guys doing to get ready for the next season? Well, uh, first part of that question to answer uh, 2020 season was crazy for all of us, um, for everybody. A lot going on in the world that has nothing to do with sports. Um, and here in Louisville, in particular, a lot of social unrest around the Breonna Taylor case and things like that. And uh, it, it's just been a crazy time. What I was really pleased with for my team was that my players stayed focused um, through all of the ups and the downs, um, kept themselves as safe as possible so that we could, if we had the chance to return to play, which we eventually did, um, be ready for it and, and, you know, we went the whole season without having a COVID test in, in our own bubble, which is remarkable, really. Um, it is. And, that's, and, inc that's incredible. Oh, that's, yeah. I, 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 yeah I, but I, that's, <laughs> I mean, it, so it's been crazy. You know, we, we started off the restart poorly in terms of results. I thought we played really well, gave away a couple balls out of the back um, in a couple games that led to some poor uh, results. And, and then we kind of, because it was a shortened season, had to respond. And we went on a, I think we went 13 games unbeaten. We're on an eight-game winning streak at the end. Um, 
you know, really tough for us to lose the Eastern Conference final to the Tampa Bay Rowdies. But that's sports too, you know. Um, and in that game, I thought we were, you know, we went down in the third or fourth minute. I thought we were phenomenal in the first 30, um, playing some amazing soccer. Uh, and it just didn't, we didn't find the back of the net um, early enough, gave away a second one late in the first half and, uh, you know, just not enough to get back in that game. But all in all, you know, really proud of, of our team, our staff, our club, and the fact that we were able to, to work through so many problems. Jake, I'm sure you guys feel similar. Congratulations uh, to you in Greenville. That's awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Parksy got coach of the year, I saw. So, yeah, yeah it's well deserved from him. Yeah, now he's going to rub it in my face for sure. So, um, <laughs> well, I mean, you have, you have plenty of bragging rights on him. Ha happy for him. Yeah. Happy for him. I'm happy for you guys. <laughs> Thank uh, you. Thank you. And then, David, the second part of your, your question is that, you know, we've just, the minute the season ends, you go right back to work to see how many players you can get back in that locker room that you want to keep. Um, and we're fortunate because we had a great group of players. I think the game as a whole is about relationships um, so that there's a deep understanding of, of what one another is, is trying to do on the field. And our goal is to try to bring back as many players from uh, – the 2020 season as possible. We've been fortunate in this club to do that for a long time. And right now we feel great about where we are positioning ourselves for uh, 2021. Can you maybe just talk a little bit about, um, you know, the challenge that you guys face as far as, um, you know, scouting and trying to identify the players that you really want to bring into the club uh, for, you know, the next seasons and, you know, maybe give us, you know, like, without getting into a lot of detail, but just for the, for the fans that, you know, what, what are some things that, you know, we have to look forward to, you know, if we're able to go and buy a season ticket, you know, and hopefully you're able to go to the games, like what are some things that we're going to maybe see, you know, if we're a Louisville uh, fan? Well, uh, I'm trying to think of how many players we have already announced are coming back versus how many I know are coming back. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and so there's a little bit of a difference there. But I think fans, uh, you know, not only are our fans at Louisville, but ar around the league should be very at least interested in the fact that we are going to return the majority of, of our, our team, not just our starting 11. I don't ever think of it as just a starting 11. We are a deep team. Uh, we have uh, depth at every position right now, but we're very pleased with what we have returning. This year, David, has been a really tough year to scout. I mean, from travel restrictions to not a lot of games going on. Um, and I think you're going to have to, any coaching staff uh, in any league, and for sure domestically in the U.S., uh, is going to have to look around the league and, and the games they played, games that were played, and do the bulk of their scouting um, and recruiting from those games. Again, that bodes well for us and that we felt good about our team, we wanted to bring back the majority of our players and we've been able to do so. Do, do you guys sometimes, you know, I mean, obviously also like the MLS, if there's a player that, um, you know, an MLS club uh, releases that becomes available that maybe he's not looking or maybe he's not going to get picked up by another MLS club. Is that, that's also a player you identify as well. Yeah. And we, you know, this year we rely, relied on two loans from MLS teams and, that's always something that we'll need to keep our fingers on the pulse of. Um, and yet you don't want to depend on that. You know, there's a little bit of good fortune, timing, uh, and, and opportunity, really. Do we need a player? Uh, is there a, a club willing to, to loan us one? Um, you know, we, we probably uh, are going to need to go to that well, uh, at some point, but there's a lot of moving pieces that are going to happen between the end of the MLS season. And it looks like we're going to have a, you know, probably a later start date, both the MLS and the USL. And so that's going to, you know, leave some time uh, for us all to try to figure those things out. What do you think is behind? So Louisville, who don't, those who don't know, you guys have been around six years, I believe as a franchise and Eastern conference final every year. Uh, you've won two USL championships, made the final a third time. 
Um, and, and it has spanned different head coaches. You came in in 2018, you won the title in the final in 2019 and this year Eastern Conference Finals. But before that, they had success as well. So what is kind of behind the infrastructure at the club that in lower leagues in, around the world, and especially in the U.S., there's so much turnover, and you guys have been able to keep that core group of players for so long. You now have a really nice new stadium. Like, what is behind that? Is it just a great ownership group? That, that's certainly part of it. Uh, our ownership group is incredible. Um, I know from my personal experience since I've been here, um, we've been, you know, we don't have a, a never ending uh, bounty of resources. It's not that, but we have support. And when we have really needed something, you know, I've had the good fortune to be able to go and, and ask for, for whatever it was that we thought we needed. And our ownership group has been good about doing their very best to try to provide that. Um, that's part of it. Um, you know, then I think we have a culture that is really uh, deep and has some fun, very strong fundamental values within the locker room. And that, to your point, Jake, happens with players. You know, if players understand what a club is about and then they – they try to always reach that, you know, high standard that we have set here at Louisville. And we have a lot of those same players return. That's part of it. I think you have to treat players well too. And, and our club, our front office, our ownership group, um, coaching staffs, we, we pride ourselves on trying to be as professional as possible and trying to treat these players who we are asking to, to do everything in their ability to be the best version of themselves we're asking them to make sure that when they do those things, we're going to, we're going to take care of them. We're going to treat them like true pros. Um, they're going to live in a, you know, good housing. They're going to have insurance, you know, a lot of things that go a long way, especially in 2020 um, our players know that they're going to get here. You know, hopefully they, they think the training is quality training that the coaches are good uh, all of those things. But I think the core is that we've had a group of players here for an awful long time that understand the standards and the expectation of our club and our culture has been strong. It was strong before I got here. Um, you know, when I, when I got here, things don't always stay the same. Every team has a different culture, but there is a core and fundamental value system there that is, uh, that is pretty strong. He made me just touch on, uh, and you touched on in some other interviews, and I thought it was really interesting that you expressed a strong interest in continuing to stay with Louisville and not going back to MLS if an opportunity were to become available. And maybe just give us some insight into that thought process. Um, look, I, you know, I'm fortunate to be in the, the MLS for almost six years. Um, I understand it really well. Uh, in the USL, it's a different, you know, set of set of rules basically. And, and I have the ability as a sporting director and a head coach. Um, if I like a player, I can go out and get them. It just is a matter of whether he wants to come and I can afford him. And the MLS, it is very different. Um, and so I, I really enjoy that part of it. And then specifically here in Louisville, I mean, we, when I got here, we're playing in a baseball stadium. Now we have this brand new stadium, state of the art, um, soccer specific, right outside of downtown. We're building a brand new training facility. Uh, to answer your question in, in full, David, you know, we have a lot of control over what we're doing. And, I, and as a head coach, I really like that aspect. And we have so many areas of growth. We are, as I said, have a new stadium, new training facility, but we're building out a, a brand new youth program boys and girls, you know, we're adding a women's team next year in racing. There's so much happening here in within our club and in a city that I think has a lot of, uh, you know, I wouldn't have said this before I moved here, but it is a fantastic place to live. Um, you know, there's so many things going on in this uh, city and community that are pretty unique that you wouldn't think about if you didn't live here in Louisville, Kentucky. So we have a lot going on and, I know I've said it before, but my goal is we still have so much more to do. You know, I think we should have won two of those USL championships that we didn't win. Um, so we have work to do. We have a number of young players coming through our pipeline that I would love to see develop into first team players on a regular basis in Lynn family stadium. 
Um, and, and that means that we have to invest a lot of time in it. Uh, and I guess the other part of it is that, you know, I've been doing this for an awful long time and, and I'm really happy where I'm at. And that to me is more important than to, you know, say I'm coaching the MLS again. What would you say to maybe outsiders, maybe even spe- uh, supporters who, when I think it was, was it 2018 or I think it was 2018 when you guys won the league and FC Cincinnati, they won the regular season, but they crashed out in the first round, second round, whatever it was. I can't really remember exactly. And then they go to MLS. What would you say to that kind of, I mean, I know MLS is a different structure entirely, but some supporters may feel like there's kind of a ceiling in terms of what Louisville city or any USL club can do just in the American pyramid. Yeah. It doesn't matter to me. Um, I think building a good club is building a good club. And I've said this many times, if we were in any other country in the world, we would have been in the, the top flight um, from the very start because we have earned that right. Um, but that's not how this system in, in the U S is, is working at the moment. And so all we can do is be the best version of ourselves. And if you build a brand new stadium, you know, in close proximity to downtown, you build a brand new training facility, you know, you're adding youth programs and another uh, professional team uh, in the women's team, you know, what more do you, do you really want? And so, you know, here in Louisville and in this area of the country, we have something very unique going on and it doesn't matter, uh, to a lot of us, whether we're, you know, in the MLS or not. Um, I, I can't imagine that at some point somebody won't recognize from outside how, how great this little uh, pocket uh, and our club is doing. And then that might turn some heads and it might change. But right now, you know, we're, we're truly focused on trying to be the best club that we can be in the USL um, and are really happy about it. We have a great uh supporting group in terms of our fans you know they are incredible our, our stadium even we had it only 30 percent capacity this year but it was loud it was energetic you know you could feel it the atmosphere was was electric and so as a coach or a player what more can you ask for you know you're you're living in a great city that has everything that that any city around the world wants to offer and you have a, a club that's trying to provide and support you in all the right ways and you're being treated like a first class pro that's what we're aiming to do yeah, you, you definitely uh make it sound very attractive for a soccer fan to want to go to louisville and just see a game and see what's going on down there and you know m- much in a similar way is uh, a few years ago when seattle people really started taking notice of how big of a crowd they were getting and how much they had going on or portland like it does sound like louisville's a real uh, in, in a country of up and coming soccer cities, that sounds like Louisville is very much on that. Uh, David, you know. I'll tell you, I cannot wait until Lynn Family Stadium is able to be at full capacity because this thing is going to be rocking. Like, I mean, it's just crazy. I, I, I get goosebumps talking about it. I mean, we had, you know, a little under 5,000 fans uh, there this season. And at times, I literally am looking around going, how are this, you know, this few fans making this much noise? And, um, you know, it's not only, there's some, you know, we have a light show that's kind of going on now. You have these bridges in the background, the, the downtown skyline and the other, I mean, it's just, it's, it's unique. And it is, you know, I think of Seattle, I think of Portland, um, places where you're in close proximity to everything that you want to be around in, in terms of a downtown and a community. And then having uh, your athletic facilities right there and for a, a soccer club. And, and the reason this whole thing was built was because we were a successful soccer club for five years before. It's pretty amazing. Yeah. You look at USL, you think of Louisville City, you think of Phoenix, you think of Tampa and maybe like a Sacramento in there. But you guys are the, the main franchises that everyone else should try to be kind of replicating and it's not always easy. A lot depends on market, uh, like you're saying, and the, the Louisville area has, has taken to it. But I, as a player, I mean, I, I know, I know I'm not going to get signed by Louisville city. I'm, I'm well aware of my uh, limitations. No, but... I think you're pretty, you're on our sheet right now, but I can't tell Harshie <laughs> that. Or I'm just in trouble. But uh, it, you guys are definitely a franchise that I, I would be, I would feel so lucky to play for. And the one thing we, 
we talked about, and a lot of people don't even know about USL and league one and championship is, I don't know exact numbers, but most teams don't offer insurance. And that is such a basic thing that when I was negotiating a deal with, with Greenville two years ago, and I, at the time I, I, I never played in USL before. And I was so shocked that no insurance, you're, it's your own problem. Like you deal with it yourself. And Greenville's a great, a great club. Don't get me wrong, but it's, it's great to see clubs like Louisville going out of their way for players and, and really looking after them. Yeah, I agree. I mean, when you're talking and, and think about 2020 and, and everything we're going through with COVID-19 for a, a professional athlete who if you're going to try to, to do this, you know, at any level, you're always running that fine line of being the fittest you can be, you know, being an optimal conditioning and or going a little over and being hurt. And if you don't have insurance, um, you know, I don't uh, look, I mean, I have a, sons that are playing right now and it, it is it's not easy uh, to think of all the situations from an athletic standpoint, if you have an injury, um, much less now being in a, a, a world pandemic where, you know, all of us are at risk. And that is just a, it's a reality that we're all living through right now, but it, it puts the emphasis on the fact that health insurance is so important, you know, just having the ability to get good health care. I mean, it, it's incredible. It really is. With everything that you've done, you know, with the national team, with, with MLS clubs, you know, or club with club union with USL now, and, and you're in such a sweet spot, you know, as far as opportunities to be coaching, what, a, what about the challenge of possibly, you know, going to Europe? Has that ever come up? Would that be something that would have intrigued you? Uh, you know, obviously, you have to see what the offer would be, but is that something that, you know, is there something else out there for you that you haven't done yet that you want to do? Yeah. I mean, there's always things that you want to do. And I mean, there are places around the world that I would love to go um, and coach at. Um, however, you know, I have a family. Uh, I, um, thank goodness my wife is stuck with me through all these crazy moves. Uh, at one point she said she would live under a bridge with me and I, I <laughs> took her very close to that bridge. So uh, you know, you have to consider all of those things, uh, when you're talking about in your career. And now that I'm, you know, much older, uh, and have been in it, uh, longer, uh, you know, I look for being in a place where I can do what I love to do and I can still provide for my family. Um, not saying that I would never consider something overseas. Um, but that might've been about 10 years ago when I was looking for an opportunity. And right now, um, really happy where I'm at. Um, but you never know. This game is crazy. Uh, it, my own career path has taken some interesting twists that I could have never envisioned um, and not by my own choice sometimes. So that's the reality of being in this business. Uh, and if something comes up, we'll see. But happy where I am right now and happy to just be able to go on a field and, and continue coaching on a, a daily basis. How much would you say, I mean, the YouTube viewers will see your gray beard just because you're talking about age. Uh, how much would you say that, I mean, a lot of players or professional players go into the, the coaching side of it, maybe at 30 when they retired and you, you played one season professionally and had a good college career, but you were what, like 23, maybe when you started, you were very young. So how much do you think that helped you in a sense? Cause you, you started so early and you got straight into the coaching side of it. Right yeah. The I mean, I think it helped in this career tremendously because I had to, you know, I had a coach who believed in me as a player and as a coach, Walt Chisowitz. And, and he told me the whole time, you're going to make an excellent coach. You know, you're going to be an excellent coach. And here, I want you to coach this team and I want you to take over the women's club team. And he just threw me into, uh, and I should say Jay Vidovich did the same thing. So they just threw me into these environments and kind of let me learn on my own, which was invaluable. I tell everybody who's looking to get into coaching, especially, uh, you know, after their, their playing career is over, that they should get some experience just being in charge of whatever team, whatever level they can, because being in charge, being responsible for a group of people, especially a group of young people, you know, so that you can teach them, but also take care of them make sure they're healthy and safe. Um, 
and emotionally healthy and safe. You know, uh, all of these things are, are things that you just have to learn. And if you're learning them in your mid thirties versus for me, I was in my, you know, my early twenties doing it. Uh, it, it, it has made a big difference in my career. And I think back um, on missing some playing opportunities, Jake, but I was, a, I benefited from the fact that there weren't a lot of places to play professionally. And I, you know, kind of was, was thrown into the coaching ring uh, and, and loved it from the first day that I ever started it. So, um, you know, you count your blessings for sure. Uh, looking back and, and I, I, um, I feel very fortunate um, that I had those opportunities at a young age. Do you, do you mind just talking a little bit about Walt Chiswick? Because we've, we've touched on in, in our podcast with some of the other folks you talked with, you know, Bruce Arena, uh, Bob Bradley, and, and not to overlook them by any means, but Walt, we haven't really uh, been able to cover with somebody who knew him, you know, so maybe if you could just talk a little bit for our listeners. Yeah, before, before the Bruce Arenas and the Bob Bradleys, it was the Walt Chiswick show. You know, um, and it was it was pretty special to be around because he was he was a larger than life figure um, in terms of American soccer. Uh, you know, he was running the national team program. Uh, he had qualified the Olympic team for the Olympics in in Moscow. You know, and he was running coaching education and changing uh, our coaching education program. So for those of us and for a lot of people in this country. Um, to have spent time with him and to have been around him. And, and at the end of the day, have him say, Hey, this is what you should do. You know, you, you know, I didn't know I'm a young, young adult trying to figure out what I'm going to do. I thought I was going to go into the medical field, to be honest. Right. Um, and he told me I was crazy and that I should be a coach. Uh, and un unfortunately it took him passing away still when I was a very young coach for me to finally commit like, okay, he believed in me this much. I'm going to do this. Uh, but he was an incredible person. And the, and the amount of coaches that have, you know, come because of his influence is, is pretty amazing. I mean, Bob Gansler is probably number one on that list. And, um, you know, Gans became a huge influence of mine. But there are so many others uh, that, that I was fortunate to, to be around a table sometimes or to be on a field and just watch them work and pick up little ideas. And, um, you know, I, I can't speak about it enough. Um, Walt was a huge influence uh, when I was coming through as a collegiate player. Um, he actually, uh, you know, he started a professional league at one point. Uh, he, he was the man. And I'm, I'm certainly very thankful that I had the chance to play for him. Is there anything in particular during those years that you're with him that you think you still use today? That's kind of putting you on the spot, but. Wow, well, there's so many things. Um, you know, he was a thinker and he was a problem solver. Uh, and uh, while he, you know, he, he was, he had this persona that he was very powerful, but um, with the players, I think he was very thoughtful too. And I try to think about when I'm faced with difficult decisions that I should be like him and I should, you know, take a deep breath and, um, I don't have to make that decision right away. I, I need to contemplate a little bit. I need to come to a really good uh, answer about what I think I should be doing. And I, I certainly saw that in him very often. Um, and then the other thing that I would say is conviction. You know, when you believe in something um, and are passionate about it, you know, express yourself in that way. Um, he was also one of the best storytellers I've ever been around. So I, I would sit around a, a table with him and whatever, whoever he had around the table and just listen to his stories. Um, and he had a lot of them and, and they were pretty amazing. So uh, tried to steal as many ideas and, and little things from his personality as I could. Are there any stories you could share with us as far from just looking back on your experiences with, with the Philly union with, or with the national team just any really fond memories, just fun, fun times that you can share with us that, you know, people may, may or may not be aware of. Uh, yeah. I mean, I, I have a lot of, I have a lot of good stories and a lot of fun ones. Um, it just depends from, from, you know, what time and era uh, we're talking about, but I would say that I had um, 
for my first U.S. under-17 team, this was in 2005. We went to Peru for the under-17 World Cup. I went there. Um, Bruce Arena, by the way, um, who, again, I got to spend a lot of time with, and I've had uh, the good fortune of being around a lot. He had named me the under-17 coach when John Ellinger left to go to the MLS. And uh, part of that reason that I think he gave me the job was, and he told me this, he flat out said, hey, you know, nobody else wants this team, you know, and you're the only guy that's been through CONCACAF qualifying already. And CONCACAF is a whole nother ball game. So I'm going to give you the job, but good luck. And uh, <laughs> that team, that team, like everybody wrote us off and, and there were, and I'm like, wow. And when you, when you, get a team and and the character of that team and the culture of a team starts to build and you know internally that something is so special with a group that's the way I felt about this uh, group that we took to Peru in, in 2005 and it was a phenomenal group of, of players and our staff um, and you know we, we made the the quarterfinals of the World Cup we lost to Holland in the quarterfinals I thought we kicked their ass um, the referee was appalling. That's a whole nother story. The referees were Argentinian. Now, this is true. The refer the referee crew was Argentinian, and the Dutch staff in the pre-game meeting the day before basically protested, and they said it would never get a fair game from an Argentinian crew, based on you know the I think it was the the seventy World World Cup, and so like now you're I'm thinking what is going on here. And it, it turned out to be, I'm not blaming the referees, but, but we played really well in that game, lost to a good Dutch team. Uh, and that group of players and our team, you know, far exceeded all expectations. You know, we beat Italy, I think, 3-1 in that World Cup. Um, you know, and some of those players and, uh, are now coaches and some of those guys are, are still playing. Um, and a lot of those guys have gone on and, and had incredible careers that again, at the time, nobody thought that team was going to do anything. So just one of the stories. And, and I, I guess I would turn this back around, David, to when you have a, any team, um, you know, they always have their own character. The team has some kind of personality one way or another. And, you know, luckily um, I was around that team as an assistant coach before I got the head coaching job and I knew it was special and, and then it turned out to be so. And I'm, you know, I still communicate with those guys to this day and talk about how incredible that culture was that we had on that team and, and how, uh, you know, it was great to have success, but it's always the process about how you work. And that was a pretty uh, amazing group. I got lots of other stories, probably with every team. So we can talk about this <laughs> for can, hours. You can but... go as long as you want, John. <laughs> we don't want to take up too I, much time. I have one question. So I think the Freddie Adu is my age or a year older. And when I was 13, 14, I remember his second MLS game was in giant stadium. He was playing the Red Bull or the Metro stars with DC United. And he scored his first MLS goal. And there's all this hoopla and like, every, I mean, everybody in world football, not just in the U S was following him. And he was and in that world cup. He was phenomenal. I mean, at least from, I didn't watch game by game, but from highlights and stuff, so what do you kind of do you did you kind of see anything then that could maybe lend itself to say oh he might fall off in his professional career is it just something he had so much pressure on him and it was unfair to a player of his age Yeah there's a lot there Jake um I I did you know I was coaching Freddie uh with the under 17s we went to Finland um in the 2003 under 17 World Cup he scored a hat trick against South Korea in the first game. Uh, I go back to we're in World Cup qualifying, my first experience in, in World Cup qualifying in CONCACAF. And we were in, um, where were we? We were in Honduras. Wait, Honduras, maybe Guatemala. I think we were in Guatemala. Sorry. One of the, um, one of the and, and we were playing Jamaica and he put on a show. Uh, and, it, and we'd seen it in training. You know, and everybody that had seen him live, you know, he was only 14 at that point. But we're also thinking, okay, can he do this on the world stage? And he literally dominated the game. 
against Jamaica, um, put our put us easily on our path to qualify. And then in our first game in the World Cup in Finland, scores a hat trick against South Korea. We, that team finished in the quarterfinals. We and we lost to Brazil uh, in in that World Cup. But you know he was phenomenal at that age and. Really, I think the only thing that any of us around him at that point thought that would stop him is if, um, you know, all of the attention, all of the, the things that, that he has an opportunity to now do in life are presented to him. Those were going to be the, the only things that were ever going to hold him back, um, you know, without going, you know, I have other, you know, experiences. I coached Freddie in, in Philadelphia as well. Um, but I think you know, as a starting point, he had all the tools and was a phenomenal player, you know, probably worthy of Jake when you watched him, you know, thinking that um, the sky's the limit for him. But I I just, at that time, I couldn't believe he was my age or a year older. I was like, I was five foot two, a hundred pounds soaking wet. And here this guy is playing against men in MLS. And and for the first couple of seasons, he had success. DC United won the MLS cup the first year. He scored a decent amount of goals and it's just, I mean, there's, there's tons of stories out there um, yeah, around the world in terms of players who have just not quite reached their potential. potential. But it's, as from a U.S. perspective, we kind of put all the eggs into that basket in a sense. So it's just kind of sad to see where it's gone for them. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you. Um, look, Freddie's still, a, a, you know, he's, he's out there right now trying to continue his professional career. And I, I hope but, you know, no one's rooting for him harder than I am, but he has to learn a lot of the lessons that put him in the position because most often, you know, you get to, to the professional level and it's not just about your quality. It's about your mentality. It's about your daily habits. It's about what you do as a professional player, you know, away from the field that oftentimes dictates where you, you end up being uh, on the field. Um, and that's a hard lesson for, for players and especially players who at an early age are given, not given, he, he earned it, but, you know, he was certainly had a lot on uh, his table at an early age where maybe he wasn't quite ready for those things. Um, just, I don't want to keep you too long, John, you know, if, if, if it's okay, just one more uh, for me. Um, I just wanted to, you know, David, I told you I'll talk all day about soccer. Okay. <laughs> so, like, no hey, we haven't, hey, we haven't even gotten to the Philly Union parts of it yet. This, that's the best part. Um, <laughs> I just want to touch on whatever John wants to, but uh, I, I, I'm really curious because I, I know you've done a lot with sort of like putting out the, you know, criteria or, you know, the developmental program, but more so I'm interested in just your thoughts on the level of coaching here in the U S and like, you know, where are some of the key areas we need to focus on in order to upgrade that level? Not that it, it's uh, not to try to knock it or anything, but just there's always an opportunity to improve always ways we can get better. And I think there's definitely some for sure, you know, at, at this point. You know, I, I, the first thing I think of when I hear, when I think about, American coaches and the need for us to get better, especially relevant to our colleagues around the world, is I think we need respect. Uh, I mean, the lack of respect that American coaches get um, is is astounding to me. Uh, And so uh, at some point, and I say this a lot about American soccer culture in general, like we need to stop having this inferiority complex. We need to stop believing that we're the minnows in the, in the world of soccer and, and football. We need to start having the confidence and the swagger that gets coaches uh, and players, uh, you know, to do what we've done uh, despite the fact that our culture in America is not a, a, a soccer culture. It's growing and it's, it's grown by leaps and bounds, you know, in, in my lifetime. But now we're to a point where, um, there are so many good American coaches out there, but they, they literally don't get the respect um, that, you know, somebody, and I'm not saying this because I'm, I'm you're going to think, oh, I'm not even going to say it, forget it. Um, it's just that I, I really honestly think that there are so many quality guys and women in this country that have worked a long time 
uh, applying their trade and done everything. And you can always do more. Okay. You can always steal an idea from somebody else. You can always watch a session or watch a game or, or go somewhere in the world or, or go somewhere down the street and pick up an idea. I think the, the willingness to learn and having a growth mindset is huge, but I come back to the fact that I, I really think that as a country, um, in terms of our soccer, we have this inferiority complex because we believe that we don't have good enough players. We don't have good enough uh, coaches and we don't have a good enough league and blah, 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 blah. And that always puts us back. And, uh, and that just pisses me off, David. So sorry, I didn't mean to get on my soapbox, but there you have it. <laughs> Mindset's a good answer. Yeah, we, we discussed growth mindset a lot here at Greenville Triumph. So uh, we're very familiar with the term. I actually have a theory on American coaches and commentators in terms of not getting that respect. And I think a lot of it just comes down to the way we talk about the game. I think the ideas are right in a lot of sense. But for example, like if on Fox Sports or whatever, you have Tim Howard, Stu Holden, whoever you're listening to, and they obviously have incredible amount of knowledge on the game. But a lot of times even American fans, we want that American or that English announcer who can just say things in a more elegant way. And I think the ideas a lot of the times are exactly the same and the same applies for coaches. I don't know if it's my thoughts are completely wrong, but I just, I, I think it's something. And when you, as a coach, when you aren't respected, you you feel like you aren't respected, you then lose that confidence. And that's how the inferiority complex kind of grows. Um, but. Yeah, look, I, I, I agree with you. I don't know what it is, but when, when you talk about the American sports culture, because it's not rooted in soccer, you know, it's rooted in football and baseball and basketball and, and these other sports, and uh, it's a different kind of coaching than and a different kind of sport. You know, we, we have a very player-centric sport. And a lot of our American sports uh, are more coach centric, you know, a stoppage every time you do something wrong, a timeout here, a TV timeout. Um, you know, we have a this player centric and we have this idea that everybody around the world does it better than we do. And that is true in some cases. And, and you can make the argument that, you know, there's, Argentinian uh, coaches do it better, or there's better Argentinian players or Brazilians or, you know, Spaniards or, or English players. We can't argue that there aren't great minds and great players and great coaches from other places around the world. But at the same time, um, you know, with the experiences that so many of our coaches have had um, and traveling the world, and I'm, you know, I feel like I've been very fortunate to have traveled the world with mainly with U.S. soccer and seen and watched training sessions and clubs at the highest level um, with the national teams. And at the same time, I, I cannot, you know, understand how the fact that, you know, just because somebody is not from here, they know more than, than we do about the game. I think that's a falsehood for sure. Maybe just to kind of play off that, what what are your thoughts, if, if you don't mind sharing them, about, about Greg Berhalter and, um, you know, the, the the folks that are saying, you know, we should have gone or should go towards a foreign coach? Look, I, I like Greg. I like Greg, and I think he's doing a good job, and I think you see that on display right now, that he has this idea to introduce a lot of young players um, into the men's national team. But it's a different job. You know, I've been on that staff twice, you know, once, once with Bob Bradley um, and now recently with Dave Sarakin for, for the year that he was the interim coach. And that, that position is, you know, you're under the brightest spotlight and it's an incredibly difficult position because you, whoever you call in from however you do it, you know, you're expected to, to not only win the game, but to play in a way that gets our fans all excited. And that is that doesn't happen sometimes. And so um, when I think about Greg, knowing him uh, like I do, I think we have a young American coach with a lot of experience internationally. Um, and, and at the same time, you know, he has a lot of ideas that he is trying to express and, 
build into a national team. And he, and at the moment he's trying to do that through a, a crazy 2020 where we have this world pandemic. I mean, he deserves a lot of credit. Now he'll have to go through world cup qualifying and going through CONCACAF is unlike, I mean, I, I think anybody who goes through world cup qualifying in CONCACAF should earn some kind of, you know, extra level of, of status because it's crazy. Um, and I can't even describe the craziness, but just everything that you don't think is going to happen is going to happen. And, and so he has to go through that. Um, but I really think that he and his staff, especially with the player pool that he has at his, uh, uh, right now, especially with the young guys coming through that he has the opportunity to do something really special with that group of players. What's your craziest CONCACAF story? Hotel fire alarms going off, planes, anything? Uh, yeah, everything. <laughs> um, uh, I mean, I could, I mean, where to start? I mean, having eggs, tomatoes, bags of urine, bags of coins thrown at you, having your your bus rocked, you know, almost off its axles at times, trying to get to a game, um, you know, going into places like Guatemala and Honduras and Costa Rica. Um, there are Jamaica. It is, it is, it's a different uh, thing. And it's not without any, you know, no disrespect to those countries, but those are soccer cultures that are so passionate and so rabid. Okay. <laughs> that things that happen um, there are, you know, you don't see very in other places around the world. So um, you know, I have a lot of stories. I'm, I'm shouldn't probably tell them. Um, but there are, there are certainly some good ones. Um, you know, I, I, um, we were going to this game in San Jose, Costa Rica, and we couldn't get to the game because the fans stopped us. And then, then they started shaking the bus and then they started throwing just pelting things at us. And the, the Costa Rican police had to bring their basically, the police on these huge horses. I don't know what kind of horses they were, you know, probably you're going to get some feedback on your podcast about me not knowing, you know, what type of horse it was, but these things were big. And these things just basically just bowled people out of the way so that we had this little, you know, kind of uh, area around our bus. So the bus could just forward, uh, get forward a little bit um, into the stadium. And that was at the old Saprissa stadium. And, and uh, you know, at some point, I'm not sure we all felt like we were going to get to the stadium, you know, um, that's just one example. Uh, and, and there's a lot of others. Uh, go, I'll tell you another Saprisa story. Okay. This is with the, the under 17 team. We're playing uh, a friendly uh, and somehow uh, Costa Rica decided to bring a witch doctor into the locker room and they took out a little concrete block between our locker room and their locker room and they lit a fire in the, their locker room, but they blew all the smoke into our locker room. So we had to leave our locker room and just warm up under the, the, you know, the stand in Saprissa to get ready for our game. This is not, you know, this is not, this is life. This is just what we had to deal with, you know, and then we talk about dealing with officials and some of the nuances that, that they, and how they see the game or some of the officials and what they'll ask you to do. Um, it, it's, it, I, I feel like I have some, some good stories to tell maybe later when I'm, uh, you know, at that point where I'm writing a book or something like that. Yeah. But, I was going to say, save it for the book, John. You don't want to give you yeah. much work. Save it for the book. <laughs> I'll, read, I'll read your book. That's for sure. I love reading those kind of stories. And that's not even getting into the pitches, how bad they are. In, well, not all the time, but in general, and also how muggy and humid and just disgusting it is down there. I mean, that, that, that is just, there's so many external factors. So when you see the U.S., they lose to, in Trinidad and don't make the World Cup, people are like, how could that ever happen, blah, 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 blah. But there's so many things that no one really truly understands that no, go on. You have to deal with a lot more than just the soccer part of it. And it's, yeah. it's more than, um, you know, it's how you eat, it's how you sleep, um, we were playing in El Salvador and thank goodness the hotel had this, this, these windows that were very thick and they were noise, you know, reducing windows, but they drove around our, our hotel all night long. 
the entire night, not just for a couple hours, the entire night um, with these flat semi trucks and these huge speakers on, on the back of these semi and you could see them and you couldn't hear it great, but uh, you know, um, I give, uh, you know, our whole uh, administrative staff, Pam Perkins, uh, who, if, if, if you know about Pam, you know the job she used to do for, for the men's national team as our administrator. And she positioned us on the floor far enough away from the noise. But it was pretty interesting looking out the window and seeing this little parade of, you know, semi trucks with these massive speakers, you know, speakers that you would see at a concert um, and then just blasting music all night long, um, trying to keep us awake. So a lot of those kind of stories that you just have to deal with and you have to get through. Is that, you know, uh, is that part of the reason maybe why Bruce was saying nobody would take the job or, you know, like as far as the CONCACAF qualifying, like he gave you the job. Is that, is that on it, like seriously like a, a factor where some guys might take a college job or, or something like that to like get away from all of that kind of nonsense? You know, David, you're going to have to ask Bruce that question. I, I, I thought <laughs> it was a compliment and then an insult, and the, which is pretty much classic Bruce arena. If you're, if you know him well, like he will, yeah. he'll compliment you and put you in your place in the same breath. And he certainly did that to me uh, when he told me that he was going to give me the job, not necessarily because I was the best one for it, but I was the only one that had been through it at the time. So um, I don't know whether he meant it or whether, uh, you know, but I, I haven't forgotten it. Um, and it was a pretty, you know, uh, funny story for me personally. Uh, you know, I'll take it. I had the opportunity to take that team uh, to uh, qualifying and then fortunately to the World Cup in 2000. And I'm very thankful for it. Well, John, we might have to get Bruce's email from you so Dave can reach out and try to get him as a guest. <laughs> Dave will reach out to anybody and everybody, so he's, he's not afraid. <laughs> yeah, I'm a little Bruce, afraid of reaching out. He's already to told me that if I give out his number or his email to anybody that um, – um, excommunicated forever so uh, I, actually, luck, I actually did get a reply from him on by email one time long time <laughs> yeah. i might have been peddling jake or something i don't know like you know nobody please take jake at one point you know and like he actually did respond i think he just said no or something but you know <laughs> yeah you know I'm, I'm we're we're kind of making fun but i would tell you that every time that i've ever needed bruce for anything uh, and, and sometimes there can be years in between he and I corresponding. He's, he's amazing. And he takes care of, he really does an amazing job of taking care of people that, um, you know, have worked for him, have been close to him. Uh, I think that's one of the special things about Bruce. Uh, you know, we talked about Walt a little bit, but I'm, I'm definitely um, very um, blessed to have been around uh, Bruce arena and to see how he leads um, and to been hired by him several times uh, because without um, those experiences, I certainly wouldn't be where I am today. Yeah, without a doubt. So I'll, I'll give you his number if you really want, but then I'll have to. You know, no, we, we don't want you to be excommunicated. It's okay. Um, Dave, Dave, will, Dave will find his uh, somehow on Google or he'll find something. He'll go, he'll go down a rabbit hole. I don't know how, but. <laughs> Good luck with that. <laughs> So John, we really want to thank you so much for, for sharing your time and being so generous and, uh, you know, really enjoyed this a lot. You know, if there's any, anything else, uh, you know, that we didn't touch on, you know, people can let us know and uh, we'll follow up with you. But is there, um, is there anywhere where folks can follow you on social media or anything like that? Just do you, do you use that or, or no? Or... I, I have, I'm, I've, kind of i'm off social media right now but my yeah. my handle is hackworth soccer so okay uh i've been on twitter and instagram um at hackworth soccer but yeah. i just decided I, I told my team earlier this year that i wanted to um you know stay a little more focused for the playoffs and my way of getting more focused was to remove myself from social media and it definitely was a good thing um, yeah it is a good thing I, I haven't decided to get back on it yet because you know, in this whole presidential election and, and all the craziness, I just yeah. want to stay away from some of those things. Yeah, that's that's probably a smart move. Uh, well, John, thank you so much for your time and 
from my own playing career, even though I never ended up coming into preseason with the union, I, I definitely look back getting drafted by the union, which you were a part of the, you were the head coach at the time. I look back, back on it with a little bit of pride, even though we never met in person. So thank you so much for coming so on the podcast. coach in the union when you were drafted? You didn't know that, Dave? And you didn't know everything, yes. John the was, was, was the man who drafted me, and he was also the man... If you want to listen to our other episodes, you can explain. There's an explanation for for why I did what I did, uh, but <laughs> it was. They thought it would be better off going to Maccabi Haifa than going to play yeah, the yeah. Yeah. <laughs> He made a really good choice. So, good choice, Jake. <laughs> well, neither neither choice really worked out for me at the time, but I'm obviously happy with with how things went. So, uh, thank you so much for your time. Dave and I really enjoyed it. We'll get this interview out in the next week. But until next time, Dave, I'm the athlete. I'm, <laughs> I'm the advocate. And we are the aristocrats. The aristocrats. <laughs>